In this video, I'm going to talk a bit about Kant's distinction between phenomena and noumena, which outside his categorical imperative is probably one of his uh, other more popular ideas where phenomena is sort of the objects that we can experience and noumena is sort of the objects as things in themselves that are sort of outside, uh, inaccessible to our experience. And so let's go through this a little bit here. So uh, every th once again, just like in the last video, everything in black is uh, just copied verbatim outside of the critique of pure reason. Uh, blue are things that are uh, sort of my little comments on it. And you will also see we have green here once again for uh, Dina Emunts and uh, then we'll get to purple here in a little bit. But anyway, so this first part here, but although these rules of the understanding are not only true a priori, but are the very source of all truth, that is, of the agreement of our knowledge with objects. Uh, so the agreement of our knowledge with objects. And so that's that idea that we've been talking about that, you know, the objects that we experience have to sort of... Uh, they have to satisfy these things like the categories of understanding and our a priori intuitions like space and time. Uh, and as much as they contain the ground for the possibility of experience as the sum total of all knowledge in which objects can be given to us. Uh, and so this is the important part of, of this right here. Nevertheless, we do not seem to be content with hearing only what is true, but want a great deal more. And so uh, this is sort of getting at Kant's thesis that, you know, a lot of the metaphysics of people like like Leibniz and Descartes and, and uh, so forth uh, are sort of talking about things that we can't possibly know about, you know, the, like the soul and monads and those kinds of things. Uh, and Kant argues that that our mind really wants to understand those, even though it's impossible for us to understand those because they don't fall under uh, our sort of, they don't satisfy the conditions for us to uh, sort of understand them. Uh, so, all right, the understanding can never determine for itself the limits of its use. Uh, so the understanding uh, uh, essentially doesn't know that it can't go beyond uh, what it's, you know, what we can actually experience, so what we can actually sort of intuit in space and time. Uh, so the understanding can never determine for itself the limits of its use and know what is inside or outside its own sphere. If the understanding cannot decide whether certain questions lie within its horizon or not, then it can never feel certain with regard to those claims and possessions, but must be prepared for many humiliating corrections uh, when constantly transgressing, as it certainly will, the limits of its own domain and losing itself in follies and fancies. So these follies and fancies being sort of, you know, that, uh, that sort of Cartesian, Leibnizian style of, uh, of metaphysics. All right, so what we call the transcendental use of a concept, so transcendental use of a concept is the idea of using the concepts or the categories of understanding outside of experience. So the transcendental use is sort of opposed to the experiential use in any proposition. All right, so what we call the transcendental use of a concept in any proposition is it's being referred to things in general and in themselves. But in its empirical use, it is referred merely to appearances, that is, to objects of possible experience. What is required for every concept is firstly the logical form of the concept, a thought in general, and secondly the possibility of giving to it an object to which it refers. And so this is essentially, uh, so we could think about it like we have to have an object in space and time you know, so we see things in three dimensions. So there's this object in space, and of course it's persisting through time. 
Uh, and so this is the object to which we refer. So that's the, the referent uh, of, you know, some, some proposition. Uh, and then we have to have the logical form, which is the categories of understanding. And so, you know, this thing has a certain magnitude. Uh, and, you know, as I said, it's a substance that persists through time. It's uh, in a sort of thoroughgoing causal relationship with everything else in both space and time. Uh, and so uh, what is required for every concept is the logical form of the concept. So uh, the logical form might be saying that, you know, that this thing here, so uh, that this thing here is a cube. So that's sort of the logical form. And, you know, we could, you know, say is a, you know, dot, 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 and, you know, whatever we predicate. So we're predicating, you know, here cube of this. So that is the logical form of a thought. Uh, so the logical form of a thought is, you know, the judgment. So that table of judgments, uh, and then the possibility of giving it to an object to which it refers. And so to have an object that it refers to requires that uh, we are sort of re uh, referring to a specific uh, position in space and time. So the object is taking up some place in space and time. And, you know, that is sort of the referent uh, of our, of our, uh, our concept there. So all concepts and with them all principles however possible, they may be a priori, refer nevertheless to empirical intuitions, that is, to data of a possible experience. Um, so once again, this is just saying that the concept has to be about something that we uh, can experience. All right, so we require that an abstract concept be made sensible, that is, that it is corresponding object be shown in intuition because otherwise the concept as people say is without sense that is without meaning uh, and so uh, Kant actually gives sort of um, an example of saying that you know when we're using mathematics uh, we, in order for us to really understand it we have to give it some sort of diagram you know you can mathematically sort of describe a triangle, but to sort of uh, have it in intuition, you have to have sort of this spatial uh, idea, this sort of spatial intuition of a triangle, for instance. Uh, and so the concept has to be made sensible. Uh, and that's what that means, that it has to be made into something that uh, can be sort of intuited in space and time. So with all categories and with all principles drawn from them, we could not define any one of them really, that is, make comprehensible the possibility of its object without at once having recourse to the conditions of sensibility and to the form of appearances. And so once again, that's kind of saying the same thing that we, we have to have, uh, have this, we have to have, go, have recourse to sensibility, uh, to the spatial, uh, the spatio-temporal intuition. And so to understand an object or a concept, we have to be able to uh, have recourse to the sensibility. Even if we're talking about something very abstract, something, you know, purely mathematical, uh, to truly understand it, Kant is saying, we have to at least, it has to be at least possible for it to be understood in uh, in some spatio-temporal sense like this. Uh, and so, you know, kind of going, you know, off Kant here, we could even talk about maybe, you know, the reason, for instance, why like quantum mechanics is so unintuitive is because this idea of a sort of probability wave uh, or a probability amplitude, really, you know, so even before you uh, multiply it by as complex conjugate to get the probability distribution, uh, you know, we can have in quantum mechanics, you know, something that has this probability amplitude like this. And so there's this idea, what does it mean to have, you know, negative probability? And so that's sort of this 
thing that makes it difficult for quantum mechanics to understand is because we don't have this nice recourse to uh, to spatio-temporal uh, intuition with it. And so Kant declares then that the uh, the proud name of ontology, so you know things like the the monads of Leibniz and things like that. Uh, this should be which, uh, which presumes to supply in a systematic form different kinds of synthetic a priori knowledge of things in themselves. Uh, for instance, the principle of causality must be replaced with the more modest name of a mere analytic of the pure understanding. Uh, and so uh, Kant is essentially saying that uh, that we can't know about the things in themselves, so all we can talk about is the things as they appear to us. And so, you know, I've been kind of picking on Leibniz here. The Leibnizian idea of the monads is something that's beyond what we could ever really know and talk about. And so, uh, and so it's not really worthwhile to even try thinking about those things. All right, so here in blue, I kind of summed up uh, sort of a long passage. Uh, so the pure categories cannot determine an object because they're too general. Without an object, judgment, the subsumption of objects under concepts, uh, for instance, using the schema that I talked about in a previous video, is empty. The merely transcendental use of categories, therefore, is in fact no use at all and has no determinant of even with regard to its form determinable object. Hence it follows that the pure category is also unfit for any synthetic a priori principle and that the principles of the pure understanding are only of empirical but never, never transcendental use. But that there can be no synthetic a priori principles at all beyond the field of possible experience. The pure categories without formal conditions of sensibility have only a transcendental meaning, but do not do not admit of transcendental use. For such a use is in itself impossible because the categories lack all the conditions of being used in judgments, that is, the formal conditions of the subsumption of any supposed object under these concepts. And so, you know, essentially this is saying that you know, the, the categories of understanding uh, are, are just purely formal. They're, they're empty of content themselves unless we can have that object, uh, that object here of experience. So we need that object to give content to the categories of understanding, uh, which are uh, essentially purely formal. And so the sort of metaphysics that tries to go beyond experience uh, is is attempting to use just the categories of understanding but using the categories of understanding that way has no content so this this metaphysics that attempts to do that is sort of empty and does not have any content and so that is what Kant is saying all right so here if by noumenon we mean a thing insofar as it is not an object of our sensible intuition and make abstraction from our mode of intuition, it may be called noumenon in a negative sense of the term. If, however, by noumenon we mean the object of non-sensible intuition and admit thereby a special mode, a special mode of intuition, namely the intellectual mode, which, however, is not our own, nor one that which we can understand, understand even the possibility, even this would be a noumen in, in a positive sense. And so uh, I won't read through everything here, but essentially what Kant is saying is that, you know, we understand objects, uh, we understand objects in space and time, but this isn't necessarily the only way that an object could be understood. Uh, there could be some other way of, of understanding the object uh, without space and time. But we humans, since we have to use, since we have to use space and time, we could never even conceive of what an intuition that doesn't use space and time 
would even uh, would even be like. We we wouldn't be able to even you know proffer what this could possibly mean to have an intuition that doesn't use space and time. Uh, and so Kant here, so I underlined this intellectual mode as a special mode of intuition. So Kant is talking about uh, a, a form of intuition that doesn't use space and time. And he says that this would be, uh, this would be the noumenon in a positive sense. And so we can't possibly even know or comprehend whether there is a, an intuition in this positive sense. Uh, so if we attempted to apply the categories to objects which are not considered as appearances, we should have to assume an intuition other than the sensible one. And thus the object would become a noumenon in the positive sense. Um, so down here, there may indeed be things of the understanding to which our sensible faculty of intuition has no reference at all, but our concepts of the understanding being mere forms of a thought of our sensible intuition do not reach thus far. And so what is called a noumenon by us must be understood in general only in a negative sense. And I put down here in purple, so this is uh, from the the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia, this top one in the darker purple, then this lighter purple is uh, from this uh, other philosophy website. I think it's the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And these are talking about uh, uh, the philosophers Fichte and Schelling, who both uh, come after Kant. And they are essentially saying that there is uh, a sort of um, what they what they come to call the intellectual intuition, uh, and so they argue that there is this intellectual intuition, uh, and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of you know what Fichte and Schelling and you know then what Hegel says about this, uh, you know because this intellectual intuition. I mean, you could probably do an entire PhD on this idea of the intellectual intuition and what the uh, the German idealists who are these these philosophers Fichte and Schelling and Hegel being uh, the more prominent ones who come after Kant uh, are known as are oftentimes known as the the German idealists and they do accept this intellectual intuition and of course from Fichte to Schelling and then Schelling to Hegel, this idea of the intellectual intuition kind of morphs and changes in what it means and everything. And so, uh, and so what I mostly wanted to point out he here is that uh, these people have s saw what Kant was talking about with this intellectual mode of intuition and sort of ran with that and said, actually, that is possible. Uh, and then they try to show in various ways in what way the intellectual intuition is possible. Uh, but anyway, like I said, I'm not going to get too deep into that. Uh, all right, so now the concept of a noumenon, that is of a thing which can never be thought as an object of the senses, but only as a thing in itself, solely through the pure understanding, is in no way contradictory, for we cannot maintain that sensibility is the only kind of intuition. And so Kant is using this idea that there could be other ways than, you know, the spatio-temporal type of intuition we have uh, of understanding things. And so, uh, and so saying that uh, our way of intuiting things isn't the only way, that is why we can say that the concept of the noumenon uh, isn't contradictory. Because, you know, Kant is here saying, well, we can never know the noumenon. And then, you know, the, the, the question then would be, well, then how do you know the noumenon exists? And so Kant would, would sort of respond to that by saying, well, our form of intuition isn't the only possible one. It is possible there could be other ones, uh, but those other ones, you know, maybe would have some other way of intuitions to be, uh, some other form of intuitions, but they would also not have, have uh, access to the noumenon. And so the noumenon is sort of this, you know, this sort of, you know, question mark 
you know, it's sort of this question mark in the middle uh, going to our, you know, our space, our space and time intuition, but it could also be going to other forms of intuition. Uh, but all of them are kind of connected by this noumenon here in the middle. Uh, and so that's how we can know that there is this noumenon, even though uh, we can't actually know what the noumenon is. All right, so Kant says the concept of a noumenon is only a limiting concept and intended to keep the claims of sensibility within proper bounds and therefore only of a negative use. So he means this negative form of the uh, of the noumenon. So the positive form is being essentially to posit a a a way of understanding that would actually be able to get at the noumenon but the negative sense is sort of uh, saying that the noumenon is this kind of inaccessible thing and uh, therefore we can't actually have any kind of metaphysics about this noumenon uh, so no objects can be determined for these intellectual concepts nor can they be asserted as objectively valid and so this is uh, sort of con getting at this Leibnizian metaphysics is invalid because it reaches beyond the objects of sensibility and attempts to conceive of objects in themselves independent of the forms of intuition, which is space and time. And so near the end of this passage, Kant uh, sort of says that the pure understanding, so the uh, the categories of understanding uh, can only apply to analytic propositions, you know, so sort of the uh, bachelors are unmarried men kind of a thing, which gives no new knowledge, merely states that a subject is contained within a predicate. And so knowledge equals uh, synthetic propositions, uh, but we cannot connect the subject and predicate without some further third thing, which is experience. Uh, and so, you know, synthetic propositions are things that you have to sort of go out in the world and actually discover, you know. So if you want to know that, you know, Mount Everest is tall, you know, the, the proposition Mount Everest is the tallest mountain, that's something that you know, somebody had to go out and actually measure the heights of all these mountains and determine that Mount Everest was the tallest one. The being the tallest mountain is not contained in the concept of Mount Everest. And so what, uh, what was needed was experience uh, in order for uh, this to become knowledge. Uh, and so experience occurs in intuition, which is space and time. Uh, and so, yeah, that is sort of Kant's uh, way of thinking about the phenomena in noumena or phenomenon in noumenon, uh, which, you know, once again, phenomena are sort of the, the objects of experience and noumena is sort of this, you know, inaccessible thing outside of experience that, we, we know is there because uh, we know that our way of experience, our spatiotemporal intuition isn't the only possible way that experience could happen. Uh, and so noumena, we can be sure that there is some kind of noumena out there, even though we can't actually know what that, uh, what that noumena is. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this video helpful and uh, maybe you understand and appreciate this uh, this to me I think is probably one of Kant's most interesting ideas uh, I mean I think it's this phenomena and noumena thing that really uh, got me interested in Kant in the first place why I it's one of the things that really got me think uh, got me to think that Kant was you know this really sort of interesting thinker was this phenomena and noumena thing and you know then I kind of got into Kant further and further from there, but it was this, this was the thing that kind of introduced me to his philosophy and got me interested in it. Uh, but anyway, I hope this uh, helped you to understand it a little better, and I will see you in another video.